Um, the Dakota Access Pipeline has, is in full operation as of June 1st. Um, and in February, the camps were completely evicted forcibly by law enforcement. Um, so right now, um, many of us have um, taken a different approach at the fight and have been very involved in the divestment campaign to uh, put pressure on banks to divest their money in um, um, projects like uh, the Dakota Access Pipeline and many European banks even are, are funding the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, so right now there's no camp and there's not that front line. However, um, Standing Rock Sioux Tribe and this, the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe are, are fighting it in court as well. Um, fighting it in the court in the legal system has never really been my approach because I'm a, a, you know, I learned how to be a frontline activist at the No Dapple Resistance Camp. Um, but there is some new information that was actually published today, um, which is actually really exciting news um, that uh, the court, um, federal court today uh, ruled that um, the Dakota Access Pipeline um, and it being built is a violation of the law. Um, it violates uh, uh, a number of different laws. Um, it violates the, the National Environmental Policy Act. Um, it violates our constitutional rights, our, our 1851 um, Fort Laramie Treaty rights, as well as other laws. So um, today is a today is a really good day. I, you know, I'm still skeptical. I still, um, when I hear an announcement like this, it's you know there's still a lot of processing that has to happen through the courts, um, and I. It, when I read the article, you know, they're going to be reading, or they're going to be, they haven't canceled the pipeline, um, and they'll be meeting about it next week um, to continue on with the process of, you know, what what their next moves will be in terms of whether or not the, the pipeline um, should be shut down. Um, and right now, my hopes and my prayers are that um, because they, they broke several different laws during this and now the federal um, court system um, acknowledges that. Um, my hope is that they will shut down the pipeline. The courage for me to continue on fighting against the violent police repression um, mainly comes from the just knowing that our water is in danger and that if all of our water is gone, none of us are going to be able to survive. Um, we understood going into it after the water cannons um, and after seeing so much police violence, um, many of us um, accepted the understanding that we could die on the front lines. And for me, um, if I were for to die for the water, it would be something very honorable, and um, that is something that I am willing to sacrifice. I think a lot of it had to do with the exposure that um, that the fight was given because of the nonviolent direct actions that were taking place, um, many, um, the world began to watch when indigenous water protectors put themselves on the front lines and put themselves in front of um, construction equipment. Um, and it was the use of, of, of tech, technology and, and using live streams that really um, made the movement go viral so quickly. Um, and that the world was watching and we didn't have to depend on, on um, mainstream media sources. Um, so the people were seeing that and I think that um, that really cultivated the people. I think that really uh, uh, motivated the people to, to come um, in solidarity because 
um, the movement isn't just about you know one reservation and and their water sandy rock is hit by um, will hit will be hit first and their water will be contaminated first so it um, directly um, impacts the standing rock community first um, but I think the world um, also had a had a common understanding that this um, pipeline is another oil extraction project and um, the effects and the impact that um, extracting the oil have is um, will reach everyone globally you know so I think that's a big part of the reason why so many people came together um, and then as far as uh, you know indigenous nations go I mean you know there is this is the first time I mean there this is like a like an awakening there's like this new level of consciousness that that um, so many hundreds of indigenous communities um, um, felt you know, um, and I think a lot of that has to do with just our spirituality. Mm -hmm. Before I, I went to the No Dapple Resistance Camp, um, I was not in touch with my, with my spiritual side. Um, and a lot of that has to do with, you know, my mom um, being in boarding school and losing a lot of her spiritual practice. So going to the No Dapple Resistance Camp, I really learned what it meant to pray and to be prayerful with our actions. Um, and to me, it really, ha it really helped um, balance and helped uh, keep me from becoming aggressive. Prayer uh, and spirituality helped me um, because the spirits told us that this needs to be a, a peaceful movement, you know. Um, so it helped because there were moments, I mean, I got shot on the front line uh, quite a few times and, and for me, um, there were moments when I wanted to react in an aggressive way. Um, but after going to ceremony, after going to sweat lodge, after uh, praying really hard, um, that helped me really balance out this uh, aggressive feeling and and you know it, it brings a lot of um it really helps calm me in in those states you know so we use it as a way to help empower us and help us stay calm and and collected while we're on the front lines you know i, I would say um many different communities were were um inspired um, by the movement. Um, there were a lot of indigenous communities and people within those communities that were never activists before that became activists and really had, had no hope otherwise. I think there's so many more people um, around the world that understand that the impact of these oil extraction pipeline projects is detrimental to to the globe um, and that's why I think um, our fight is is bigger and it's it's stronger um, than the local uh, workers of North Dakota that really only care to um, make a paycheck off of um, an oil pipeline project. Um, one of the best ways to contribute to the No Dapple movement well, while um, being in places abroad is to uh, mobilize around the, the divestment movement. Um, you know, we have to we have to continue on with uh, with our with our message that you know there's European banks um, here that are, are funding the desecration of indigenous land, the genocide, the v environmental genocide, and the environmental racism uh, towards indigenous people on Turtle Island. Um, I think that information needs to be made public. I think more and more bank shutdowns need to happen and more people need to organize and uh, mobilize um, um, doing bank actions and, and you know, uh, make you know, make as much uh, noise as possible so that um, the people of Europe have a, a um, understanding of how these um, banks are, are, are funding um, 
you know, the destruction of our, of our community. Mm -hmm. Independent media has been supporting our fight the entire time. Um, they're a huge reason why uh, the No Dapo movement had so much attention with democracy. Now she showed up and she she covered what was going on, and um, they published it, and that like that brought so much attention to the movement and what we were doing. Um, so it's important. Um, that we highlight that um, there were many different uh, alternative media um, s sources that were there with us on the front line documenting what was happening. Uh, their, their platform was already relatively large for a, for an alternative uh, media um, source, um, and then they 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 came and they documented everything that was happening. Um, and that really helped the movement and it helped uh, bring attention to the movement, but it also helped um, it also helped uh, individual water protectors who were fighting. Um, it helped them share their narrative and their story with the world um, and to the point where they began to build their own platforms so that when they shared something, they had a, a huge audience to be able to share it with. And then there was a level of uh, a reciprocity. Um, it was reciprocal between the alternative media and uh, individual water protectors and their new uh, media platforms that they gained through the movement. I think that is just as powerful, if not more powerful, than the mainstream media. So there were many people who came to the resistance camp to make um, to make music and to um, build opportunity off of that. I never really did that. When I put my music career off to the side and I focused on um, the fight against the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, I think it's important to highlight the fact there were many rappers there. Um, who also did not uh, capitalize off of the movement. Um, I saw a lot of uh, uh, people who acted in very opportunistic ways, who came to the camp simply to film their music videos or to, um, to make songs so that it would help them in their careers, but they weren't there on the front line fighting. It was the movement for personal gain. Now, I think it's important to to um, create uh, hip hop with a social message, and um, I do I do that already with my music. You know what I mean? But I haven't made anything specifically about the No Dapple fight. Um, but I think it's important that we we do use hip hop um, as a way to. We use hip hop as a vehicle to create social change, and I think it's a it's a great way for us to um, to reach the youth um, because there are so many different uh, languages that we speak as people. And um, when I go to like panel discussions or I go to press conferences, there's a a certain demogra age demographic of people that show up. Typically, the people are a little bit older. But when I go to a hip hop show, I see young people, you know. And if we can use our message of resistance in our music, um, I feel like um, that's going to be able to reach the youth and they will be more, um, more aware of the issues and hopefully um, they become activists themselves and, or join the fight. Um.